Brian Dawson, CEO of 1819 News. What's up, my friend? Uh, just another day. You're the first CEO to ever come in this year. Well, I guess Tony Gump's the CEO of Vaporforge. Uh, technically, I would be president, not CEO. Okay. Presidente. So you are the first CEO to ever be on this podcast, which is probably something we never thought would happen because we're not like serious people. Yeah. So, well, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate yeah. it. We uh, we need more important people on this podcast. Yeah. So far, we've done Scott Beeson. Uh, we had David Lynham, who's a comedian, uh, and we're trying to get Larry Sinclair. So that's yeah. kind of where we're that That's where our standards. <laughs> yeah, it would really get it, suck. Get it? Is so, what I did there? <laughs> it sucks for somebody. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for uh, hanging out with us, man. Everybody knows that you guys at 1819 partner with us at 99.5. Yes, sir. Which uh, I was, I, I don't deal with any of the behind the scenes stuff, but I was always a big proponent for. Hey, let's get some local guys on the station doing local. Because when we we got to this weird spot where we were left without a news department, we had some people leave and everything, and they had us running. And this is a corporate thing. They had us running ABC News, yep. and it was like Trump bad, Joe Biden good, <laughs> like yeah. every. So here we every are. Every hour, yeah, and we're doing conservative radio, and then at the top of the hour, here comes ABC, and they're like, "Orange man bad," and so uh, I mean, the listeners would just hammer us on a regular basis. Yeah, and I'm like, I ain't got nothing to do with it. I would actually make it a point to come back from breaks and make fun of what our news said, just to kind of offset, sure, and be like, I don't agree with that. But what's interesting when I was talking to Val about that, the the and I'm, I won't go into the whole thing, or maybe I will. I don't know. But how how I came to be anybody in the media business is I worked at USA Radio Networks, and they had USA Radio News, top of the hour news. It was five minutes, and mm -hmm. they targeted at AM news talk stations. And at one time back in the '80s, USA Radio News was like you know it was it was it was it was a big yeah. time thing under Marlon Maddox and everything. They had like 800 big stations. Da 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 da. da. You know, back when AM AM was 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 the you know where to be. Well, it ended up dying. By the time I got there, they were on about two hundred stations. And um, I was driving around Alabama, listening to country western music because that's what I do. And uh, I would hear da 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 uh, ABC News, da 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 uh, CBS News, and I'm like, oh yeah, surely these God fearing rednecks down here in Alabama listening to country western, listen to old Hank. Don't want to get their right. news or get their news from you know CBS and ABC, so I went back to the news team and I, I'm the FNG at this point. Right? I'm the friggin' new guy, mm -hmm. and so I go to him and I'm like, "Hey, I think there's some opportunity here because we had a shorter news thing. Now the problem was the production on USA Radio News sounded like it was done on a Casio keyboard, but the news itself was actually really really good. My friend Russ Jones was the vice president of news. He hired really good reporters that knew how to do it, mm -hmm. and they were already talking about making it sound better. I don't know if you know who Rusty Humphreys is. He was um, there in a, an executive capacity. Rusty Humphreys. Rusty Humphreys. I used to listen to him. Like w when I grew up, I always wanted to be in music radio. Yeah. And that evolved over time. And I, you know, Rush Limbaugh was always in my life. My dad listened to it yeah. and everything else. But I remember I was probably 18 or 19 years old and I was working in some grimy warehouse getting off at 2 o'clock in the morning and I would go home Rusty Humphreys would be on the radio. I would go to sleep every night listening to Rusty Humphreys. I don't go. even remember if I liked the show, but I knew I was listening to it. He's good. And it was planting a seed for me that later on turned into what I'm doing now. So there we go. So we have that in common. That's crazy. And so Rusty was in, uh, he was an executive vice president. Of, basically, he ran USA Radio Networks. And he said, we've got, it sounds like it's done on Casio keyboard. We got to redo it. And they did. And there was a two minute, a three minute and a five minute. And so I said, what if once this is reproduced and it sounds better, I take the two minute and I offer it to music stations. And I had a really supportive team there and they're like, you're stupid. That's never going to work. And I was like, well, thank you guys. I really appreciate <laughs> that vote of confidence. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm confident. I, you know, I, I, I feel like I can do it. Humor me. Let me, you know, let me try. Okay, go for it. And it turns out I was right. And so I called all these country music stations in the Bible belt and said, Hey, how do you, how do you like your news? And there'd be a long pause and they'd be like, well, we hate it. Mm. And being the sales guy, I'm like, Oh no, that's terrible. Tell me about your pain. So, uh, what, what do you hate about it? Well, you know, we like being the CBS affiliate and everything, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I get 15 angry rednecks calling me every single day telling me I got liberal trash pumping out of my airways. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's terrible. Here, I'm going to send you this demo. You take a listen, and then I'll give you a call next week. Invariably, they would end up calling me. 
when can you know when can we sign up and da 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 and got it on hundreds mm. of music stations. And wow. So, and, and and as you know, the thing about FM stations versus AM stations is FM specifically music stations have these things called human beings listening. Right. 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 Which is important when you're selling ads. And so that was that was my launch into the media world. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I was thinking, like, when you're talking about doing news on a music station, like, that's, you know, when you're talking about, like, the difference between liberal and conservative news, it's kind of a big deal. Because especially back then, there's a lot of people listening to music radio. And a lot of those people may just say, okay, this is the news. They're telling me the truth or whatever and taking it at face value, except for those 15 rednecks who were angry about the liberal yeah, news slant. coming over. Correct. <laughs> That's wild, man. That's wild. You've got um, you've got a pretty fascinating story that uh, that I've heard bits and pieces of. Sure. And this goes back to uh, where are you originally from? Colorado. Colorado. And you were how long did you live out there? It is, uh, um, I it's jumbly. So I mean, I moved a bunch as a child, but mm-hmm. then all, would always end up back in Colorado. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know what the cumulative amount of years was, but like moved when I was two, moved again when I was six, and then ended up living in Germany, then moving back, and then so. But it was a long time. I mean that that was that was home for me. That you know that, and then my dad uh, moved to Wichita, Kansas, in a little suburb of Wichita, Kansas called Derby. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was Colorado Springs and it was Derby, Kansas. Those were kind of the two main places that I grew up. What had you hopping around all those places, my, especially Germany? <clears throat> my mom has an itch to move. She used to. She doesn't anymore, thank God. But she used to, like, she would get bored and she would just want to move. And really? Then, you know, and again, this kind of gets back into my story. Um, my mom was not a stable person. You mm-hmm. know, she had um, issues. And so, you know, she would meet a new guy and we would move. And she would right. another guy. And I had multiple stepdads and stuff like that. But then she had the great idea of joining the military. Mm-hmm. And so my mom joined the military. And that's how we ended up in, in Mannheim, Germany. Wow. Yeah. And that's, you know, how old was she when she joined the military? It was like 29, 30. Okay. Yep. Wow. That that's pretty at that age that's a pretty big decision to say yeah. I'm gonna I mean I guess if you you know you you don't like the way things are going the, the, there's nothing uh, nothing wrong with joining the military and just trying to get things straightened out sure so uh, you end up back here in we'll say uh, Colorado um, what'd you do when you got out of high school yeah so I mean I think I'll just kind of go back a little bit and so. Um, Talk a little bit about troubled childhood. My parents got divorced when I was two. Mm-hmm. Courts put me with my mom. Um, and, you know, there was a bit of a train wreck. I had no business being with my mom. My dad was obviously the much more stable person. Um, and so, you know, two to ten was, you know, watching my mom get beat. She was an alcoholic, had multiple stepdads, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when I was ten, left Germany, moved in with my dad, who's in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and there, uh, began to have stability in my life. So he, you know, went to work every day at, you know, four thirty in the morning, uh, put a roof over our head, put food on the table. We ate dinner as a family, showed up to my baseball games, kind of had that stability, but from, you know, two to 10, I had a bunch of not stability. And so I was still kind of screwed up and had anger issues. And as I got older, really the only time that I was ever comfortable in my own skin is when I used to do drugs or drink, specifically in order, drink, and then do drugs. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so I began to do that a lot. And um, I found out pretty quickly that if you're going to do drugs and, you know, you're working at a grocery store, you got to sell drugs if you're going to afford them. Right. And I had a knack for that. I was very much, I forget what that movie is, um, where the guy was the uh, party liaison. Um, can't think of it. It was Ryan Reynolds. Um, oh, the what dog is that movie? The... I can't remember. Anyway, but it was very much how that was me. And uh, I um, get busted my senior year, the beginning of my senior year, sneaking out uh, to go party and do drugs. My dad, you know, gives me a, a piss test and I failed for everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, we got in a big fight and I ended up leaving and moving back to Colorado uh, my senior year and got there. And my brother was driving for uh, a drug dealer and um uh, you know, I would ride around with him and he would have, you know, bricks of drugs, stacks of cash, girls all over him, you know, all Dang. the guys. Were, yeah. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> that's crazy. Sign me up. Right. And so I did. And, I and you're what, 18 at this point? It was about 18 or 19. Yeah. Yep. Mm. <clears throat> it was 18. And so um, 
started doing that and you know um developed that skill set really quick and i always say the same thing that makes me good at what i do for a living now which is network persuasion sales made me really good at what i did for a living then right and right. um and i did and so i started out uh selling you know weed and then next thing you know it was cocaine next thing you know it was meth and then next thing you know i'm pushing large amounts of drugs for cartels in colorado springs wow so that's crazy so you're working for the big guys at that point correct yeah and you got to be pushing a lot of product, I assume. It wasn't massive amounts, and I wasn't ever, like, filthy rich. Like, I was a lifestyle guy. Like, I was hooked on the lifestyle. Yeah. And, and I was reliable. I was trustworthy. I was punctual. Like, all the same things that make you good at, like, real jobs. Yeah, yeah. You don't you really know. get that a lot yeah, of that out of drug dealers, Yeah, you honestly. don't. You do not. <laughs> and so uh, I shined, and, so the, and, and I look like someone who could blend in with, you know, um, like maybe a white neighborhood you were trying yeah, to get like into. like non-drug dealers. Yes, yeah. correct. And so... <laughs> Um, but the, the biggest thing it was trust, you know, and those guys trusted me and because they trusted me, I had mm. access to them and some, some wild, wild, wild stories for sure. But it was, um, it was, I mean, it's bad. You know, you look back on it now, it's like, I don't know how I survived, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I think and so we, it's, it's, we, I think we can all look back at certain points in our life. Maybe it's not that dramatic, sure. but we have moments where we're like, man, we shouldn't have made it out of that. Yeah. That's that's pretty wild. So how how far did that take you? That so it was about a five year five year deal, and in that five years, I racked up six felonies. And what that looks like is, I would get arrested, I would bond out, I would get arrested again, and then I would get sentenced to probation. And then on my probation, I would catch another case, and I would get arrested, and I would bond out, and then mm. I would catch another case, and then they would give me probation. That happened, you know, and it's just stacking up charges do you find yourself in a situation where you get arrested and then you know not only are you you're catching these charges and facing you know punishment but you've got fines and everything else and you got to turn around and maybe sell more drugs to pay those fines no, i didn't give a crap you weren't you weren't worried like, about the fines <laughs> wasn't worried about going to probation meetings wasn't worried about gotcha, that, dude. yeah gotcha. and so um, you know, I always justify that. I'm like, well, I mean, I have to sell drugs to support myself. It's like, bro, you get a job, <laughs> yeah, you get a job, true. you know, yeah. but I didn't want to hear that. Um, so yeah. And, and again, like I was, I, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol. It reminds me of, uh, drugs and alcohol have ruined my life. <laughs> 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 um, I was hooked on substances, but to me it was more the lifestyle, bro. Like I would get up every single day especially once i so kind of the progression went from weed to cocaine and doing cocaine and i was pushing lots of cocaine doing lots of cocaine just and have i mean just more than you could ever do right, right? and and just rails and i would do so much cocaine to where I, I couldn't breathe out of my nose and the next morning it was the next afternoon because it would be like three or four in the morning i take xanax go to sleep wake up blow my nose and like just blood snot right. cocaine would come out and as soon as my nose stopped bleeding i'd do it again well, it got so bad, like, I've got a messed up, deviated septum. I couldn't even do, like, couldn't even snort drugs anymore. I'd yeah. done so much and whatever. And so that my friend's like, here, smoke some crack. And I was like, I tried it. I'm like, that's not my bag. It's not for me. And then he's like, here, try some meth. Like, what a great friend, by the <laughs> yeah. way. Right? Like, where do you get friends like this? We'll yeah. find you oh, something, yeah, we're going to get you. <laughs> uh, you but I, I mean, yeah, it's uh, that is exactly how it went, though. <laughs> And uh, he he got me hooked on meth, and buddy, after that it was it was on and cracking. And I mean, I never slept, and I was always out, you know, you know, coming up with some great plan of how we were going to put some system together to do. And yeah, you, you went know, from Mr. Kinds. Reliable to Mr. Super Reliable because, yeah. like, you yeah. were on the go yeah. 24 7. Yeah, I had a 24 7 business card basically at that That's point. That's crazy. So, so yeah, it was um, it was crazy, but so you rack up. Oh, it's six felonies. These all drug related, drug related, drug felonies. assault, stolen property, but it's all drug related. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it all comes to a head when. So, yeah. And so, um, I mean, there's so many, you know, weeds we could go down, uh, like getting into the weeds about it all. But I think just kind of a cursory overview. Um, trying to think what the year was. It must have been 2005. Um, all my cartel connections either went back to Mexico because they would come over in like seasonal like shifts. Mm -hmm. So my guys either went back to Mexico or they got arrested and they were arrested. And then I ended up bonding out or whatever. And so now I don't have my big plugs anymore. And so, um, I get involved in, um, again, the, 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 uh, creative, um, uh, meth economy 
where I did know, like we called them paisas, which means paisano, which is fellow countrymen, was what you called Mexican nationals. So you got Chicanos and you got paisas. Yeah. Paisas are the, the dudes from over the border. Okay. And you would meet them, and I didn't have the connection like I did with the other guys, but, you know, they were like, can you get, you know, stolen motorcycles? And I'm like, yeah, I can get you stolen motorcycles. And so <laughs> what a we ended up, man, yeah. this and guy so, is. We would fill up these storage units uh, with stolen motorcycles, you know, ATVs, like, you know, this is like back before the player side-by-side days. I'm sure yeah. we had those, but it was like all, you know, uh, Yamaha Banshees or, you know, just four-wheelers, crotch rockets. And what they would do is they would fill up trailers with them and then drive them back to Mexico where they weren't checking. And then they would have these cr- brand-new crotch rockets over in Mexico or whatever, these brand-new four-wheelers that weren't stolen once they were across the border. Man, I've, I've played a lot of GTA in my yeah. day, but I've never lived it like yeah. this. Like, this yeah. is wild. And so they would give me an ounce of meth for every motorcycle or four-wheeler, and then I would turn around and, and sell that. And that was my business model. Well, we had, I mean, I'm talking the storage units full, okay? And one of the guys gets busted – this was another reason that I had a lot of trust is that I never told on anybody the entire time, my entire everything. I never ratted anybody out, never told on anybody, took everything, you know, to the joint. And yeah. that was it. And I really believed in that. Like, whatever I really believe in, I believe in. That's why I am the way I am about conservatism and everything else. I, I believe this. And I believed in that. Well, these other guys, like, in my mind, they're all that way, too. They were not. No, no. <laughs> they get arrested. They jump in the back of a cop car and they're rolling around and be like, Dawson keeps motorcycles there. Dawson tied yeah. motorcycles there. <laughs> oh, they're man. all busting these things open full of motorcycles and everything else. And, and they finally go to this guy's house. And, and, and this one was the dumb one. I never should have had anything in this guy's house. He never should have got interrogated by the cops. Like he was never the guy that I was anticipating whether I went to prison or not was whether this guy kept his mouth shut mm-hmm. or not. Right. And so. Um, but the cops raided his house and he sang like a bird, which again, you know, it was my fault for ever having something there, but he still broke the rules. And, uh, he told the cops, you know, not only, you know, is this, is this motorcycle, you know, Dawson's, but you know, he also carries a, a 38 special on his waist. And I was like, bro, are you like trying to get me killed? Like, what, yeah. what, what, what are you doing? And so anyway, he, he airs all that out, whatever. Why well, I, I catch wind that I've got uh, a warrant out for my arrest. I've not been to a probation meeting in six months and I'm just like. I don't know if I have a warrant or not. I don't even know how to check for that. So, like, I call my probation officer, and I'm like, hey. And you hadn't talked to him, haven't him in six months. I haven't talked to him in six months. <laughs> and he goes, why don't you come? And, th- and this is, like, how gullible I was when, when it came to dealing with that kind of stuff. Very stupid in hindsight. And I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I've heard I've got a warrant. And he goes, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. And why don't you come in and we can talk about it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? No. And I'm like, yeah, no, I think I should. I want to do. I want to start doing better, you know? <laughs> and so I go to see the probation officer. And uh, there's the cops are in the, like, so the door, anyway, oh, I guess we're on camera. You can see it. The door is here that I walk in here and there's two cops here and I walk in and shut the door and boom, they freaking uh, cuff me. Did you ever even see the probation officer? Yeah, he was there and I was like. Yeah, thanks, you know, buddy. Thanks, thanks I thought you were bunch. my friend. Yeah, I thought you were here to help me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so that was wild. And and, and even then, I had um, uh, keys in my pocket. And he's like, "Oh, how did you get here?" I'm like, oh, "I borrowed my aunt's car, and it was a <laughs> stolen car." And then they're out in the oh, park, like going around the courthouse with the key fob. And then they find the stolen car. And inside the stolen car, there's like a, a, a ring like this with all these key fobs oh, and all these other man. stolen cars. So was, do you cap all the all the keys from all the stolen vehicles on one key well, ring? Well, we had all the, the vehicles, yeah. And so we had all the vehicles like spaced out throughout the city. And, and again, it was just there was always this a plan. Like a for, car lot, man. Yeah, this is crazy. It was, it was nuts, man. <laughs> but and you know what's weird is I've never talked about any of this ever. Like, really? At this depth or at this level. Man. So I guess this is always what I anticipated going on Joe Rogan. Some of the stories <laughs> I would tell. Yeah, this is it. That's, so. it, that's wild because, again, this is uh, – I, I heard portions of your story on one of, one of the 1819 podcasts you yeah. guys do. And, um, you know, when you think, all right, this conservative news station CEO, you don't expect those stories to sure. come out of that person. So it caught my eye when I, I think I might have seen a clip on social media. And I'm like, I got to find this podcast. And so yeah. I flip it up and I start hearing you talk about all this stuff. I'm like, dude, that's like a movie. Yeah. You're going to have to make a movie one day. Well, I'm working on an autobiography and I think that's the first step and we'll see. And that's the reason that I'm, because I've been working on the autobiography. I've like really been like diving into, yeah. you know, where I, cause I used to just kind of tell a, you know, cursory story, like mm-hmm. 30,000 foot is what happened. Yeah. And again, and I don't want to go and like glorify this behavior like it was good. It was freaking terrible. Right. It was right. horrible. It was miserable. Like I never knew where I was going to sleep, never knew where I was going to get my next meal. Like, yeah. And I would, you know, sell some drugs and I'd have some money and then 
Next, you know, I'm sleeping in a stolen car because I can't get a hotel room, and it was, you know, feast or famine. It was just a, it was terrible, you know, and exhausting. Um, exhausting. Probably the word. Yeah. And you know, I should, I should be dead a thousand times over. Yeah. Had some uh, really bad people that wanted to kill me. You know, I bet that's yeah. that's what I was thinking as you were explaining that. I'm like, as soon as you mentioned cartels in this story, like they you were make ne- it out alive. That's good. That's yeah. a win. And they were never the ones that were after me. Thankfully, crazy. So, so when you uh, when you get hemmed up by the cops at the probation office what uh what happens then well they they just arrested me and then i ended up bonding out again but so what comes to an end though is so um that that gentleman who told the cops um you know that and that i that they put the warrant out i get arrested i end up bonding out again um when you bond out you're like hey can i at least have one of those keys off the key ring because yeah, i gotta get, get a ride <laughs> But uh, I was in there for another four months, and, and and this is where I learned this legal thing called discovery, okay? And so, in the legal world, discovery is all the evidence that the state has against you. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm reading my discovery, because i got nothing else to do, and I'm reading it, and in this discovery, it tells you all the people that told on you, because that's part of the evidence that the state has against you. Right. And so, I'm like, and he told on me, <laughs> and he told on me, and he told, this is crazy. Yeah. And so I got out and I went and found all these people. Oh, wow. right? yeah. Okay. And, and and got into altercations with all of them. And then finally, the last guy, the one that told on me. And again, I felt terrible. And the guy that was with me was like pumping me up. He's like, you can't let him off. He told on you. We got to go in there. He owes us money. Blah, 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 blah. And so we went and I knocked on the door. He opens the door. I kind of push myself in and say, look, man, why'd you tell me? I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you. I said, yes, you did. I know you did. You know, I didn't tell you. I promise, you know, all my, you know, blah, 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 all this yeah, other yeah, stuff. Yeah. And so I just started beating him up really bad. And uh, I was tasing him and beating him. And then the guy that was with me had a blackjack. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like a leather, like small baton that's got like a, mach- like a, like a mechanical spring that's like real heavy duty. And then yeah. on the tip of it, it's like lead weight, but it's all wrapped in leather. And mm-hmm. so the way that it works is it like catches skin. And the guy I was with hit him in the forehead with a blackjack, and his head split open, and blood went everywhere. Oh man! And um, it was—I mean, it was awful. I thought he was going to die. We ended up stealing some stuff that we thought was worth money in the house, and told his brother, "Hey, you know, if 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 you don't, you know, uh, give us the money you owe us, this is going to be you next." And we yeah. left. I got arrested that night. Yeah. Yeah, and they—that's where they charged me with attempted murder, aggravated robbery, and extortion. Wow. <clears throat> and okay. they ended up dropping the attempted murder. Um, you know, and, and, and it was ended up being first first degree assault, aggravated robbery and extortion, but the original charge was attempted murder. And so, um, yeah, so that happens. And uh, I'm in, in county for two weeks, and I bond out again. Now I'm on like $135,000 worth of bonds. And I was going to say, is the judge not like, hey, this guy's a menace. Yeah. We got to keep him in here. The next one was. <laughs> okay, okay. Keep but, going. Uh, yeah, I, you, I will. Fi- I, I, I find my limits. Like I push <laughs> things to the limit. And so, um, yeah. And so I'm bonded out now. And at this point, I, I make two decisions. One, I'm done doing like uber stupid stuff as far as like going out and I don't know, beating people up. Right, people. Like right. I'm, I'm, I'm done stealing things. I'm done hurting people. Like, I've got a belly full of uh, at this point. I'm like, I'm good. I start hanging out with my brother, and my brother is two years older than me. And, like, all the guys that I used to go to school with and stuff, and they all, like, drink beer and barbecue and, like, are getting married and, like, starting to have kids. And I'm just right. like, I'm a freaking loser, dude. Like, I <laughs> suck. <laughs> but I'm not going to court. I can tell you that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Skipping bail uh, because I'm going to go do the rest of my life in prison. So I become a fugitive. And uh, I become a fugitive, and I get away from the cops on a number of occasions, and the you know bounty hunters or whatever that are coming after are me. Are you in Colorado at this, this, this Colorado point? Spring. Okay. Yeah. And so I get away from the cops a couple different times. That happens. They're putting up perimeters now. Every neighborhood where I'm known to be, they're putting up perimeters and like showing my picture. Oh, you are most yeah, wanted. Yeah, I was. At this I was point. one of the most wanted fugitives in Colorado Springs. Wow. Correct. And so Dog the Bounty Hunter, if you know where he does his work. Colorado Springs, Durango, Colorado, and then Hawaii. Those are the three places yeah. that Dog the Bounty Hunter operates, right? And so I, I have no idea. I'm just going to I'm just gonna say I don't know how true this is, but this is what I was told by an arresting officer the day that I get arrested is that Dog the Bounty Hunter was – so they were doing a 72-hour, 72 fugitive sweep that I was a part of. And so they had the Fugitive Task Force, Colorado Springs Police Department, and then you know Dog the Bounty Hunter and these other different bounty hunters, and they were going to do this big three-day sweep and get as many fugitives as they can, and I was on that list. 
but I was considered, you know, too dangerous for Dog the Bounty Hunter to come after, right? And which is like, put that on <laughs> oh, your business card. And they're like, he's armed and dangerous. And I'm like, I, I was armed with like a meth pipe and a backpack, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I was totally not <laughs> armed like, and dangerous. Even if we yeah. catch this guy, we're not going to yeah. be able to put him on the show. He's yeah. that dangerous. But the thing is, is that because Dog the Bounty Hunter, um, he has a felony and so he can't have a gun. And so he uses paintball guns. I don't know if you remember this. He used paintball guns, and he had pepper spray paintballs. I didn't. I didn't and know that, that. Yeah, and that's how he would like. You know, if people ran over, he'd be like pop, 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 and he'd get them with pepper spray paintballs. And oh, that's like, funny. Oh, and he'd arrest them. And so because of that, he had to basically like he like if someone was like for like for real legit like armed and dangerous. Um, and they pulled out a gun and he'd be like, have his paintball gun, you know? Oh so God. I don't know if it was like an insurance thing or what, but you know, the, the cop explained to me, he goes, yeah, you're, you know, considered too dangerous for the dog, the bounty hunter. And so lucky for you, you yeah. didn't get hit with pepper balls out of a right. paintball gun. Oh, I, I, it was bad though. So I'll tell you, so June 19th, 2007, this is my last day out. So I've skipped on, come one of the most wanted fugitives. They're putting up checkpoints. I've gotten away from the cops on a number of occasions, now, June 19th, 2007, I'm in a third story apartment. This is my safe house where, you know, I'm going to be. And I'm in this third story apartment here. There's another apartment building here. I wake up in the afternoon. I'm cooking bratwurst, watching the Chappelle show, smoking weed. Oh, I love Chappelle show. Yeah. So and uh, it's just a weird thing that I remember. But I look out the window and I see the front end of a cop car. They, they mm. pulled out just too far to where I could see it was the front end of a cop car with the little flashlight side mirror thing. And I'm like, oh. I know what time it is. Yeah. And um, I had, um, in my infinite wisdom and success in getting away, I got kind of cocky in my ability to get away. And so uh, my friend uh, had given me some nylon rope, and I tied it to the bottom of this recliner, this orange retro recliner that was wider than the window in the apartment. Yeah. And so I go to, to grab that, and I hear boom, and the doors, like, they don't know which apartment I'm in, so they're kicking in every single door on this floor. Jeez. Boom, Colorado Springs Police, open up. Boom, Colorado And so I'm like, I got to go. I kick out the screen, wrap the rope around my hand, and I jump, and I'm hanging three stories up. And what I didn't know is there was a surveillance van in the back. And then, you know, they called it in. Hey, your dude's freaking hanging. <laughs> and, and 50 or 60 cops come swarming around the sides with their guns drawn. Get the F on the ground. Wow. And I'm like, I don't have anywhere else to go. I kind of plan on going to the ground. So, so I drop. I hit the ground. He puts his knee in my back, cuffs me. You know, and they put me in the back of the cop car. And that was a wrap. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, that one last ditch effort. You're like, tied around the recliner, baby. Let's yeah. go. It's go time. Let's, let's roll. What is your, you got a roommate at that time or a friend that was in that the safe house with you? No, it was this kid, Mike. I don't even know Mike's last name. He just he was this weird kid. And, and like, you know, he basically had to do what he was told. Oh, okay. And he was told, Brian's going to stay at your apartment. You are not going <laughs> to say anything. And he's like, okay. And so he just is, he, it was probably a normal day for him i guess yeah, if he's until he came home these. and saw all the doors kicked in and his window out and all wonder that. wonder what it was like for um for the rest of the residents there at that apartment i'm sure they didn't appreciate having what doors after another <laughs> kicking the yeah. door open yeah god that's wild so all right so they take you and i'm not trying to make you drag this Dude, out I this is fascinating care. yeah this is so fascinating uh so they get you on that deal um they take you to jail you, you go in front of the judge yeah, so it was an ordeal, and so I'm now facing 384 years in prison if I go to trial, and, and how that breaks down. I don't know that I believe that, but like I always say that because, again, this is what I was told by mm -hmm. my uh, public defender. I said, okay, Mr. Dawson, you have the attempted murder, the aggravated robbery, and the extortion. They dropped the attempted murder to, I think it was an F3, an aggravated F3 first degree assault the the aggravated robbery was an f3 and then the extortion was an f3 and it's 32 years because they're aggravated for each of those and they're going to stack them and that's 96 this is your sixth felony and so anything three it's called the habitual criminal they call it and, and then anything four or more is called the the big habitual criminal and so they called it the little bitch which is habitual <laughs> right the little bitch and the big bitch and the big <laughs> then the big bitch is the the four times four and you were the you were the uh, big I bitch. was the big bitch <laughs> okay right? and uh and so <laughs> and there's always a reference i go back to cartman saying she's a big one anyway, <laughs> so um but yeah that was um and so they if if i went to trial they could Give me the 96, and they could times it by four, and then that's where they get the 384 years God. if I wanted to take it to trial. And so I'm sitting in county jail thinking I'm fixing to do the rest of my life in prison, 
And so I'm clicking up with some of my guys, right, that got locked up, that were in there, the, like, you know, the, the, the bad guys, if you yeah. will, the, 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 the cartel guys that are in there. And I'm hanging out with them, and I'm low man on the totem pole, and so I got to go carry out, you know, they call them the torpedoes, like, hey, that dude's a snitch, you got to go in there and handle it. And so I got to go beat this dude up. Mm. Hey, this, And so I end up catching two more assault cases in county jail. Yeah. And so I get two more misdemeanor assault cases, and they put me in ADSEG, which is called administrative segregation, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, you're in a cell by yourself, solitary confinement, 23 hours a day. You get an hour out to make a phone call. Uh, and to take a shower and then you go back to your cell. Yeah. And so I was in there for about four months and about three months in, I kind of have this epiphany moment. Okay. And, and it, it's a real silly epiphany, but it was a very substantial epiphany in my life that I realized it was my fault. I said, God thumped me on the head and said, this is your fault, Brian. Because up to that point, it was my mom's fault. It was my dad's fault. It was the cop's fault. It was the judge's fault. It was the system's fault. I really believed it. Like, yeah. I, I legitimately was, like, angry, and I was telling my family I'm a victim, and I'm part of this messed up system. And and when I came to the conclusion that I'd created this, my choices created these bad circumstances, what I realized is that I was free to make good choices that would create good circumstances. It was just, like, this liberating aha moment in my life. And so as much as I could in, you know, in a limited form in a cell by yourself, began to start making better decisions. And, and, and what ended up happening is like just an overall attitude change in me. My family began to notice that attitude change and they began to like really support me and stuff. Cause at that point uh, they'd cut me off completely. I'd get to call them like once on the weekend, they would answer and talk to me for 20 minutes and that was it. Yeah. And they began to notice the changes and stuff and really started to, you know, get back in my life and, and believe that they, they sense, they know me, right? They knew, and then they're like, something's changed. And so they started to kind of get back behind me again. Well, my, uh, my, uh, not my attorney general, uh, my, <laughs> so you have the district attorney and then you have the, uh, public defender. Yeah. My public defender, uh, which is not when you're facing 384 years. Like, is that you know, what uh, you want? No, uh, no, no, no. Comes back to me and says, okay, Mr. Dawson. They're willing to offer you if, if you know, if you go, if you, if you, if you go to trial, you can get 384 years if you lose and, and you're going to lose. And I'm like, I know <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> and, uh, they said, but they're going to offer you a 32 year sentence with a crime of violence sentence enhancer, which means I'm going to do every bit of 20 years yeah. if I take that. And so by the grace of God, I was able to get into a mediation hearing. I actually got, uh, a, it, is, it would take forever to explain it all, but I ended up getting a real attorney not like a high paid, you know, super attorney or anything like that. Um, but my family was able to talk to this guy who came highly recommended um, and was able to get him, you know, at like a fraction of the cost that all these other attorneys wanted. And he was able to get me into a mediation hearing. And, um, and what do you mean by that? Mediation, mediation hearing. hearing? Yeah, sure. So um, what happens is in a mediation hearing, you're basically like your family can write all these letters of recommendation that gets sent to the district attorney. Mm. And there's a retired judge. His name was Judge Toth. And I would be in one room with my attorney. The district attorney would be in another room. And the mediator, Judge Toth, retired judge, would go back and forth. And, and, and you'd, you'd, like, it was like arbitration. You know, It was like horse trading. And so the, 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 the district, district attorney said, we're going to offer Mr. Dawson 32 years with this crime of violence. And then I'd say, well, I think I should only get eight years because this guy got, you know, did a way more heinous crime and he only got eight years. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And he goes back and forth. Well, it worked out to my advantage because um, we had tried to get it on the calendar for like a month and we could never get our days to line up that my attorney was available. I, I was available. I didn't have yeah. a lot going on, but my attorney and, and her could not get on the same page. And so it ends up being like Martin Luther King Day or something that she has off and she shows up to the jail. We were supposed to do it at the courthouse, but since we never could and my stuff was coming up, she shows up in pajamas. The district attorney shows up in pajamas to the freaking county jail. OK, and I'm like, you know, she does not want to be there. And right. So I use this to my advantage. And I'm like, well, I got three hundred and seven years. I, mean, I got nowhere to go. <laughs> And uh, so I'm just dragging it out as long as I possibly can. And so she finally, you know, we think 32 years. Well, I think eight. Well, we think 24. Well, I think 10, you know, and just da-da-da-da-da back and forth. And then finally she comes back and says, I will give I, 15 years. I'm not going any lower, and I'm not dropping this crime of violence. You've caught two more assault cases since you've been in county jail, plus the heinousness of your crime. I'm not going to do that. And uh, I looked at my attorney, and I said, look, Judge Toth aside, you know, the mediator side, you go walk into that room with that woman 
and tell her I don't want to end up. And so Lyman is like a is like a maximum security prison in Colorado, and mm-hmm. everyone knew like that's where you go if you're the worst not, of the worst. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I said I don't want to end up in Lyman with swastikas all over my face. Okay, right. I want to I want to change my life, and I need an opportunity to do that. Tell her that I will give her a year if she drops that crime of violence. And that crime of violence sense enhancer, what it does, it means you're going to use a, you're going to do a lot larger portion of your time, and you're not going to be eligible for a lot of the vocational and, you know, educational programs and stuff that they offered in the Colorado Department of Corrections. So I knew I had to get rid of that crime of violence sentence enhancer, and so I said I'll give you a year, and she's like, oh, you'll give me a year? Where do I sign? I'm like, well, hmm. I guess all those convictions about me not getting that crime of violence went away real quick. Was, she it, was give, get giving her a year, what does that mean? So instead of 15 with the crime of violence, I got 16 with no crime of violence. Oh, yeah, that's a no-brainer for you. Yeah, for me and for yeah. her, it look, 16 looks better on her thing than... Oh, yeah, because they're you, just looking correct. for... Correct, numbers, exactly, yeah. averages. And so it was a win-win. And so mm-hmm. my ne- negotiating prowess came in once again. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Ah, man. <laughs> Never fails you. Yeah. And so I get shipped off to the Colorado Department of Corrections shortly after that. I, I left from an ad seg cell. Um, and um, oh, there's so many funny stories I could go into. I'm going to just keep it moving. Keep it moving. Now you're moving. good. You're good. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I end up... Um, you know, getting shipped off to prison, you know, you roll in and, um, you know, I always, you know, if I've got time, I tell this portion of the story because like, you go from being in county jail, which is not, not a fun place, not a good place. Uh, but then you know, like, you're, you're shackled, which is your, your, your foot cuffed mm-hmm. and your feet cuffed are chained to your belt and your handcuffs are chained to your belt and you're walking like this. Yeah. It's like in the movies. You on a bus. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's exactly what this felt like. And so I'm shackled to some dude who's next to me, and we're on this white bus that goes up to Denver Reception and Diagnostic Center. They call it DRDC. You go in there, and there's, like, this sliding bob wire fence that opens, and then the truck pulls in, and it's, like, this little, like, interim area, and then they shut it, and then they're looking underneath the van for bombs and stuff like that, and mm-hmm. there's just, like, roll upon roll of razor wire all over the place, and there's the gun tower with the armed guards that are there to shoot you if you do something wrong. Yeah. And it was a very... Surreal, surreal yeah. moment when that happened. Is so you're not in Kansas anymore. You're not in county anymore. And so I end up there. That you, you, they go in there and make sure that you're not part of a gang or you know you don't have any health issues or whatever. And they assign you to a prison. And they sent me to Walsenburg, which is Werfano County, um, Wer- Werfano County Correctional Center in Walsenburg, Colorado. Got there and uh, got to my unit. And the first guy I meet was a guy by the name of Charles Frederick. And he came up and introduced himself. He's a real big dude, bigger than me, and he's got a Semper Fi tattoo on his arm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, you could tell he'd been down for a number of years and knew his way around the joint. And uh, he says, my name's Charles. This is a faith pod, and I'm a Christian. Well, that's a really weird way to introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, especially in prison. And I said, okay, Charles, what is a faith pod? And uh, he goes, well, man, you know, we do discipleship in here. You know, I take seminary classes on the weekends, and, and we do praise and worship every morning. I said, I got to get out of here. (laughs) Get me out of here. But, you know, I just became friends with Charles, and he began to kind of plant gospel seeds in my life as conversation allowed. Yeah. And um, he ended up getting shipped to Sterling. Uh, That prison closed. I ended up in Bent County Correctional Center. I was there for six months, left Bent County, went to Arrowhead in Canyon City, Colorado. I was there for a couple months. They realized that they put me, my sentence and crime was too severe for that low of a, things it was like a vacation though i got to go to like camp cupcake for a couple months you know really it's like up in the mountains and i'm like freaking hey i can just stay here forever and then when you found Uh, out that they were pulling you out of there you were like come on but they um they ended up shipping me to sterling and sterling correctional facilities got like this horrible reputation or whatever but again you gotta understand my mindset in there was like any vocational program you got i'm taking any Mm -hmm. educational opportunity you got i'm taking any self-help program you got like i'm that is what I am on. I am on changing my life. And because when, when I got sentenced to 16 years instead of 32 or instead of 15 with the crime of violence, I made a decision that I was going to look at prison as an opportunity to change my life yeah. and not look at it as punishment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I stuck with that. I, I, you know, I maintained that. And uh, so you know, I'm going there, and I don't know anything about Sterling's programs or what they have to offer. I just hear all this bad talk. Like, inmates don't like it there. When most inmates are there, they just want to do tattoos and drugs and just whatever, right? right? They're not trying to change their life. And so I, you know, whatever. When I get to Sterling, and the programs building there is bigger than the whole facility I just left. I mean, it's massive. They've got all kinds of 
vocational training and programs and everything else. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. And so, boom, I get there. Well, first person I walk out on the yard, there's there's Charles. Oh, wow. Right? Boom, yeah. there he is again. And same thing. We become friends. He's coaching a softball team, and I'm on a softball team. And he used that to kind of evangelize inmates by coaching the softball team. And so, um, you know, there, there it was again. And, um, you know, I ended up taking, you know, college classes there. I take computer information systems. I took graphic design. I took printing technologies, all kinds of stuff that, I'm, I mean, to some degree I use now in media, uh, stuff I learned. And uh, it was good. And I did a bunch of other stuff in there. But, um, you know, a couple of years into it, Charles is like, hey, man, you need to you need some certificates for the parole board. You got a parole coming up in a couple of years. I can get you into these programs. I'm like, sure, go ahead. Well, they were end up being these like Christian faith based programs. Mm-hmm. And I was like freaking charles dude you know, <laughs> yeah, of course go put you into that. yeah yeah and the first one was kind of you know kumbaya come as you are whatever and i i really enjoyed it and so i asked charles to get me another one that was ended up not being kumbaya come as you are is very much this is what the word of god says right and so i get into it and i'm not liking it and so i'm arguing with you do an hour video it's called the truth project you do an hour video and then there would be an hour of table conversation i would just argue with these guys at the table and tell them how stupid they were for what they believed yeah right and so um, you know, and, and just cause they were Christians didn't mean they weren't convicts. Right. And so Correct. like you go tell some convict that believes in Jesus that he's a, you know, he's a retard for believing something <laughs> he, he might want to throw down. Right? Yeah, and so yeah. it got, it got heated and we were walking back to the unit and Charles is like done. He's like, dude, like I've been working on you for years and you're fixing to get us into fist fight over he's this stuff. Up. Like he's fed up. Yeah. And he just looks at me and says, Brian, why don't you give him a chance? Right. And so up to that point, um, you know, uh, I'd been told that a million times, a knee-jerk reaction. I've given Jesus a chance, da, 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 or whatever. And so, you know, I always believed in God. And, and, and through when I was on the run from the police, through my drug addiction, through everything, I always prayed to God. I knew God was real, but I didn't understand how Jesus factored into it. Right. And so, and, and it was my belief at the time, I was agnostic. I believed that a Jewish guy got nailed to a piece of wood 2,000 years ago and created a cult following. Mm. But I didn't understand who Jesus was in the Christian faith. I didn't, I didn't understand it. And so... Um, I went back to my cell that night and I prayed the way that I usually did. I said, God, if I need to believe this Jesus character was truly your son, that he was born of a virgin, because these were the problems that I had. That he was born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect life, that he died and somehow his death benefits me, that he rose from the dead. These are my issues with the Christian faith. If I need to believe those things to be okay with you, I need some kind of a sign. Yeah. And so I end up um, going to sleep that night. It was Saturday night. I end up having this crazy nightmare uh, it was horrible, and then I end up falling off a cliff in the dream. And if you've ever fallen in a dream, and like you like shoot up, you know, like Ugh. yeah, you hit the ground. Yeah, as soon as you wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I've just kind of like sweat in my face, and and I look, and the only thing I can see in my cell is a clock that says three sixteen. And if you're not a Bible, you know, guy, the, John three sixteen was the only Bible verse I'd ever known in my entire life. Right. Which is for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Which was the the question that I answered, you know, I asked, and yeah. that was the answer. And I'm like, whoa, I kind of tried to like, oh, uh, no, that can't be real, whatever. Well, it was Sunday morning at 316. And I'm like, okay, God, I'll go to church. Yeah. Okay? And so I get up that next morning at like eight, go to Christian services, what they call it. Sit as far to the back, to the side as I possibly can. And I don't remember anything that Chaplain Davis preached, but at the end he did an invitation. And I looked over at my friend Ramon that I was with, and I said, hey, man, what is an invitation? And he wasn't like, brother, that's where you invite Jesus into your heart. <laughs> he said, um, Man, if you got something hindering your relationship with God, you can go down there and pray with that man about it. Yeah. I said, okay. And he stepped aside. He already knew I was going. So I walked, you know, walked the aisle as it were. And Chaplain Davis grabbed my hand and put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know, Mr. Dawson, how can I pray for you? I said, look, chap, I'm not here to make any decisions. I just want to, I just want you to pray that God would soften my heart so the truth can come in because I can tell he's working on me. I'm fighting with everything I have. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So we get done praying and I look up in his face and he just weeping. And I'm like, what is going on, man? Like, Chaplain Davis is not like a crying dude, you know? And he's in front of 130 inmates, and he's just weeping. You're like, get it together, yeah. chap. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but uh, it had me, you know, choked up. And, like, I knew something had happened. You yeah. Know? Like, it was just I was very aware that something had changed. And uh, it turns out Chaplain Davis and Charles had been praying for me for years, right? Yeah. And I didn't know that. And um, but that's the day that I count I got saved and, yeah. and became a believer. And, um Charles gave me a Bible. He said, start reading the story of Joseph. And so I just started reading the Bible every single day, feasting on God's word. And that went on for, I don't know, about nine months. And I got, you know, I, I continued reading my Bible and I was involved in all these faith-based programs and stuff. But I, um, I ended up, um, 
like all my friends in there had pen pals. Now, like they weren't like the greatest girls in the world, you know. Right. You know? But right. they had pen pals. I'm like, man, I'd like to have a pen pal. So I get on the phone with my mom, and she's running a Facebook page for me, you know. Uh, and I'm just like, reach out to some girls from my past, like that weren't drug addicts, like a real low bar. Yeah. Like, <laughs> didn't weren't drug addicts, and so I strike out. You know, I found out that girls don't like writing guys in prison. I was like, this is so weird. I was, you know, so optimistic going into this. Yeah. And uh, just struck out completely. And I'm like, all right, I'm done. And uh, I went back and prayed. I'm like, God, if you want me to have a pen pal, you're going to have to do this. I'm good on the rejection stuff. I'm just going to keep reading my Bible and doing my programs and stuff. And so I did. You know, two, three weeks goes by. I call my mom and she's like, hey, Brian, do you know a girl named Christina Ewan? I was like, yeah. Christina Ewan was a girl I was head over heels in love with all throughout middle school and high school. Like, I went to eighth grade graduation dance with her and professed my undying love to her, and she gave me the Heisman, put me in the friend zone. Yeah, I right, right. Had you growing up. I found myself in the friend zone often. Um, and that went on from eighth grade to the beginning of my 12th grade year when I moved to Colorado uh, th- that I was in the friend zone with her. But I was like, man, Mom, if you laid out all my yearbooks from kindergarten to 12th grade and said you can pick one girl to marry, it'd be Christina all day, right, no hesitation. Right. But surely she's married to some doctor in a 3,500 square foot house with a white picket fence, two and a half kids, you know, dog, minivan. Like, that's where Christina is. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, no, Christina's not, <clears throat> but um, she wants to write you. And I'm like, does she know I'm in prison? Yeah. And I'm like, that's wild. And uh, she said, I said, did you get her address? Yeah. And so I wrote her the first letter. And I was like, look, I didn't get drunk and run somebody's dog over. I belong here. She wrote me back and is like, hey, you know, um, I got married you know had a husband and we had a son and you know we got divorced he left and um you know i'm i I, and she had just gotten saved as well like three months after i did and she was writing about that and she's like i'm in alabama Hmm. right and so i was like okay and so we wrote back and forth and um just began to talk about you know what what the preacher was preaching on you know what we were wanting out of life that kind of stuff and really just fell in love through written correspondence but i had to wow write her after she's rejected me my whole life i'd write her a letter and be like hey christina i realize my stock can't get any lower (laughs) so think about that you're going through school and you got this girl you're in love with and she's she's putting you in the friend zone year after year you never you end up graduating high school and you're like okay well that didn't work out i'm gonna have to go with my second choice wherever wherever she is and never did you think leaving high school was I'm going to be sitting in prison writing her when she finally like right. accepts yeah. me and wants to talk to me. No way. And I joke that her picker is so broken that I had to go to prison before I showed up on her radar. <laughs> right? That's my rolling joke with her. But <clears throat> yeah, and so I wrote her and she wrote me, you know, I said, look, I realize my stock can't get any lower, but I can't help but feel like there's a spark here that just didn't exist when we were, you know, growing up. And yeah. she wrote me back and said, I feel the exact same way. Whether you're out in 10 days or 10 years, I'm going to be here waiting for you. I know God wants me to be with you. Wow. Right? And, um, and she was. And so um, I ended up putting in for a halfway house shortly after that. And so the way it works in Colorado, on a 16-year sentence, at eight years, you're eligible for parole. And then um, 19 months before that on a nonviolent crime, which was key in my negotiations. <laughs> yes, very important. Uh, 19 months prior to that, you're eligible for a halfway house. And then your earn time, that comes even closer. So at five years, two months, I was eligible to get out to a halfway house. Mm-hmm. And so I put in for this intense behavior modification program called Peer One. Peer One is the most intense behavior modification program of its kind in the country. Uh, it actually just closed a couple months ago, but up to that point. And, uh, and because I put in for this crazy program, they let me out. They're like, you want to go there? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. Go nuts. <laughs> yeah. Know? And uh, it's it's like the graduation right there, I don't know, it was something like 20% of people that go there actually finish the program successfully, right? It was like a boot camp or something? Yeah, it was, it was like mental boot camp. I could, mm. We could do a whole podcast just on Pier 1. It was freaking wild. Man. Wild. But the, the goal of it was to break you in a safe environment. Yeah. So the, the goal was to, you know, I mean, they cuss you out, tell you how stupid you were, how worthless you were, all this other stuff, and you're just, like, trying to, like, do what you're supposed to do, and, like, you can't, and eventually you lose it. Yeah. And then they, then they circle up the chairs, and everybody sits down and be like, well, why'd you lose it, man? <laughs> I'm like, because you were freaking telling me I was a piece of, you know, like, what do, what do you wild. mean, why did I lose it? But but then you actually start to realize, like, why do I care what he thinks? Why do I, you know? Yeah. And, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was very, very good, man. I learned so much good stuff in that program. And uh, I went through it. It was a two-year, one-year inpatient, one-year outpatient, so two-year program. 
ended up getting through it and um the first six six months i wasn't allowed to write christina but she could write me and so she wrote me a, a letter a week for 26 weeks it's amazing faithful wow get to the point in the program where i'm able to go out on visits we got married the very first visit in my grandma's living room that's awesome and uh yeah and so we basically eloped got married and then i ended up finishing the program and transferring all my parole and stuff down to alabama and that was december of 2014 i believe and i finished my parole in april of 2015 if i'm remembering that correctly and um it was wild so like i went from doing my parole meetings in denver colorado to doing parole meetings in tuskegee alabama because we we lived in shorter yeah and when when we you know when i moved down here that was a culture shock that's crazy yeah. man listening to that story that's wild by the way uh to go from all of that to where you are today you were talking about charles what was charles yeah so charles charles frederick and charles is the guy that led me to the lord in prison he went to pier one as well um he we ended up finding a church together where he's now an elder at that church and uh i was the best man in his wedding and he's got a halfway house ministry that he runs that's wildly successful so you still talk to charles today oh yeah my son's named after him oh wow yeah i've got seven children by the way i don't know if you knew that really seven seven children man yeah Uh, what's what's the oldest and the youngest so 14 my son christina had a son when we got married Mm -hmm. or excuse me it was brennan uh, amazing young man, unbelievably intelligent, respectful, hardworking, athletic. I mean, he's just like everything you could ever ask for in a son. He's amazing. And then he's 14, and then it goes 9, 8, 6, 5. Uh, he'll be 5 here in a couple of weeks, Charles will. And then um, 3, and then 18 months. Wow. Well, those are some lucky kids to have a dad like you that's got the experience that you do. I'm, I'm thinking as you're telling me this story, I'm like, how crazy is it to you to go from all to go from all of that to where you are today? And I was bringing up Charles because th- th- that's definitely a God thing. Going from all those experiences through prison, through the assaults, through the, the drug dealing, the grand theft auto, all the way to CEO of a conservative news outlet. The second like where else? News outlet in the state. Where <laughs> else does that happen? I mean, that's crazy. No, and that's the thing is people, you know, and, and no one really challenges me on the evidence of God. I don't communicate with people even in that fashion to where like I'm going to debate you on that premise. It's right. like my my absolute presupposition is the existence of God and the truth of his word and if people want to that's fine. I'm not even going to ent- entertain a conversation otherwise. But um you can't like, it doesn't and so my dad is an atheist right and which mm-hmm. is wild i think he's more agnostic whatever and uh like the fact that his son got his life together got it like went from going to do the rest of my life in prison <clears throat> changing changing my life becoming you know semi-successful whatever you want to call it he's just like well it's finally you, you finally started listening to all that stuff i told you i'm like mm. oh, that's it dad come on that's proof yeah cause. that's it come on uh, yeah but uh what gets him is he's he looks at my wife and he's like because he knew christina right we grew up together and he's like what and, and she's the most amazing woman on the planet like yeah. unbelievable mom she homeschools the kids like un- i mean it's just like she she you know the whole idea of turning a house into a home you know what i mean like i come home like i'll come home from work tonight there'll be bed you know bread baking that she made homemade you know what i mean and it'll smell up the house it'll be clean the kids i mean it's just it's 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 crazy how like amazing the, she the is the brady bunch yeah out of your house. no it's wild <laughs> and so um she's just she's just amazing and 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 you know um she's tough all this stuff so my my dad sees that and he's like that's what gets him he can't explain that yeah he can't and you know well because of you and your situation like one day it's going to click for him yeah Um, and i know you've probably got faith that will happen as well but uh, the fact that and it's going to click because of your story and your family because like you said at some point you you got to be like how else i mean i'm sitting here listening to the story i'm like how else would that happen that's that's wild that's just that was that was much more of a roller coaster than I expected. Sure. Because again, I just heard pieces of it. Yeah. But like that's pretty. Yeah, wild, I gotta bro. tell you, I'm fascinated. I've just been listening. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. wild, man. And you know, and then my career story. So I kind of gave you guys a piece. So so I moved to Alabama nine years, a little over nine years ago, and uh, my friend's working for USA Radio Networks, and De- he lives in Denver, mm-hmm. and uh, he said, "Hey, man, do you have a job when you get to Alabama?" I'm like, "Well, not one I really want." He goes, "Great, you're going to be an affiliate relations manager at USA Radio Networks." 
<laughs> these these are I coming said, straight out of prison. Yeah. All this stuff, and now you're working at kind of a big time radio game. Well, it was not big time at all uh, at USC Radio Networks, but there was there was some interim. And so when I got out of prison, first I couldn't work because I was in the program, and I had to go through the program. And then it got to the point where you could work. I did day labor which is making like $7 an hour and just like schlepping tile or, you know, scraping insulation in 100-degree weather. or mm. It was just awful. And so my friend is working in a tax resolution firm. He's like, hey, man, I think you'd do good at this. And it's basically phone sales, and you're calling people who have tax liens to make like $280 a day, calling people who have tax liens and offering these legal services to, to you know, I'm sure you guys probably have one of them advertises on the, the station. Yeah, I guarantee, probably guarantee so. you. <laughs> Right. And so it was my job to call these people or whatever. But it was great because they had the stuff called air conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. It was big fan. <laughs> that was, that was I was able to get you. in some yeah. of that. Yeah. And, but I mean, dude, like that was, that was intense. Like, you know, the, the, I see why people quit and just give up and go back. Cause it was very hard. Uh, and, and it wasn't because the system's rigged against you and all this other nonsense. That's not it. It's just life is hard. Mm-hmm. And when you begin to face your consequences and start to make good decisions, it's, it's just, it's just hard. And I mean, I used to have to, because I couldn't get my driver's license back because I had a DUI and all this other stuff. And I had to go through these classes and pay these fines and work and get all this stuff. And so I'd ride my bike to the train station and because it was two hours on either walking, riding my bike in public transit to get to work. And so it was two hours to work and then two hours home. And I would be riding my bike and it would be snowing in Colorado or whatever. And someone would like drive by and like slush would come up from them driving by and just like cake me, you know, it's freezing cold, wet. I'm going into this law firm kind of dressed how I am now. And I'm just got like mud and sleet all over me. And everyone's looking at me like, what is wrong? Just sit down and pound the phones, get to work. And you just have to, you know, have a, uh, just a level of commitment that's, you're not going to take no for an answer. So that's why that is so wild. Yeah. So you you end up going through we talked about the 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 USA radio thing kind sure. of Sure. Yeah, no, there. that's the other crazy. So so I'm at USA Radio Networks, so I, I was doing the 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 law firm doing the tax resolution sales. That's what I was doing when I moved here. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Hey, do you have a job?" "No. Great, you're going to be at USA Radio Networks. You're going to be an affiliate relations manager." I said, "What what is what is a radio network and what is an affiliate relations manager? Yeah. I have no idea." He explains to me it's taking nationally syndicated content and offering it to terrestrial radio stations like Talk 99.5, saying, mm-hmm. hey, you should carry this news or you should carry this show. And Steve Dace was the first show that I ever represented. I don't know if you know Steve Dace. Yeah. He's my favorite. And uh, he was there, and then Rusty Humphreys came in later um, and helped him with his show. It was called Trending Today USA. Uh, but I grew their news product, as I described earlier on in the podcast, and a gentleman by the name of Lee Habib discovered me. Lee Habib created Laura Ingram's radio show back in 2001. Okay. And uh, he and um, Laura went to UVA law school together, uh, and he had the bright idea years down the road of saying, "Hey, you know what, Laura, you need to be on the radio." And I think they, she's like, "Yeah, let's do it." And he's like, "Man, you're you know you're just as smart, you're just as intellectual, you're just as articulate, you're all these things, and you look a lot better than these old gray haired guys, right?" And said, "Okay, let's do it." I think they created a segment on Don Imus, and then once they did enough of those segments and showed that it was a ratings boost, anytime they did their segment on Imus, they pitched that to Cumulus, and they ended up getting the nine to midnight show mm-hmm. on Westwood One. Yeah, and um, did that, and he was wildly successful with that show, and he went on from uh, Laura's show to where he is still the vice president of content at Salem to this day, where you know at the time he was overseeing Bill Bennett, Dennis Prager, Hugh Hewitt, Michael Medved, all them. Now it's Eric Metaxas, Larry Elder, all these other shows. Dennis Prager still um, overseeing their stuff, um, but he got so sick of angry conservatives talking to other angry conservatives about how angry and conservative they are for yeah. three hours a day on the radio, <laughs> and he said, you know. The left creates content that hits the American middle and moves them to the left. They create broad, culturally relevant content that appeals to the average person and through kind of values undertone, if you will, move people on the political spectrum or towards secular humanism on the religious spectrum. NPR is really what he was thinking. And he and Bill Bennett were having a conversation and said, you know, what would what would national public radio sound like if it was done by people who love God and love their country? And um you know, he said, so he got to work and he reversed, re- reverse engineered national public radio. And he's like, okay, this is a 501c3 not for profit that's connected to a content production distribution platform. They do $350 million a year, $350 million a year. And only 6% of that comes from the government through taxes. Yeah. The rest is like minded philanthropists, universities, corporations, pledge drives. This is the revenue model. It's like, man, that's freaking brilliant. Why aren't we doing this? And Caleb kind of is. I'm not going to get into all these media models and stuff, but. 
you know, <clears throat> shows that. It's like, this is amazing. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to get rid of the, the, the government money, but take that same, you know, uh, pie of, of revenue sources. And he did. And uh, But they not only do they make $350 million a year, they reach 33 million people a week, which is like quadruple what Rush Limbaugh was reaching in his yeah, prime. That's, right? Just, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. Right? It's insane. And so... He's like, golly, look at what they're doing. And so he really liked the storytelling aspect of like this American life, mm -hmm. full sound design storytelling. And he said, what we're going to do is we're going to create American private radio, which will be the 501c3 not for profit. We're going to produce a show called Our American Stories. And it is telling the story of America to Americans each and every night. It's a phenomenal show. It's very mm -hmm. this American life sounding full sound design. But, you know, he would you would tell the story of Tom Petty. And Tom Petty's telling his own story, talking about growing up in Florida what his dad was like getting his first record deal but he's also like it like in between you'd hear his songs and stuff and you're just hooked like yeah, yeah he doesn't yeah. love tom petty so you're hooked and then all of a sudden it'll fade and then it would go to the next story and it would just be like the seamless transition and it would be dr larry Arn telling the story of thomas jefferson writing the declaration of independence in two weeks when he was 33 years old mm -hmm. and when he signed it he signed his own death warrant you're like that's freaking amazing you know? right so there's that um and uh you know that was that was kind of the premise of the show and uh, I had the success at USA Radio Networks. He discovered me and calls me. He says, Brian, I want you to come work for me. And I'm like, well, I was pretty forward. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and you know, getting a call from Lee's like getting a call from Steinbrenner to go play for the Yankees. Like, this is – so you mentioned USA deal. being big time. No. But Lee, yes. Right? Yeah. And so I get that call. He lives in Oxford, Mississippi. So I went and saw him in Oxford, Mississippi. And I, I got, let me tell you about my felonies. <laughs> um, so you got to leave yeah, with that. Yeah. You know, let me tell and, you that story real quick. Correct. And I'm thinking he's going to run for the hills, you know. And uh, he and his wife, we were at a cafe in Oxford, Mississippi. And they were choked up listening to the story. And he's like, man, you're the exact person I want working for me. Yeah. And so he said, I want you to help me grow my show. And I said, I'll, okay. I said, but here's the deal, Lee. I don't want to grow people's radio products for the rest of my life. I want to learn the business. I will help you grow your show, but I want you to teach me everything you know. And he's like, laughs. He's like, all right, kid. You grow my show, I teach you what I know. And yeah. we shook hands. And for the next four and a half years, I sat at his feet learning everything I possibly could about the media industry. Unbelievable. Um, content production, distribution, syndication, uh, nonprofit, uh, you know, revenue, for-profit revenue, sales, fundraising, da -da -da, I mean, you name it. And he was on 80 stations when I started and I took him to 330 stations and we did a deal with Premier and iHeart which is as big as it gets in the world mm -hmm. but since we're partnered with Cumulus it's about equal to a Westwood One Cumulus deal. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but you know doing a deal uh, with Julie Talbot and um, you know Premier and iHeart it's as big as it gets and I, I, mean, I didn't go do the deal but like I plowed the ground to make that deal possible mm -hmm. and he went in and closed it but um, that was it and and so iHeart took over distribution and once iHeart takes over distribution that was my job was distribution sales and so I'm you know it was July 2020 when this deal firmed up and um, I end up uh, Lee introduces me to Bernie Marcus who's one of the four founders of Home Depot which is crazy right so you're starting to think about the, the where the story is going this is wild That's yeah wild. and so Bernie Marcus is one of the four founders of Home Depot based out of Atlanta and he had a bunch of uh, groups trying to get Trump reelected and so uh, he had a he had like probably thirteen or fourteen different groups dedicated to helping Trump and all the down ballot Republicans, mm -hmm. and they had a media driven get out the vote effort uh, that they wanted to do, um, and it was working with Sean Hannity, Dan Bongino, I mean all these guys, and and you understand media, so I can kind of explain it, where we were going to write the copy and basically just buy ad space like at a, at a negotiated rate because we were going to do such a massive media buy. And we would write the copy, and then Sean Hannity would be saying the same thing as Dan Bongino, as Ben Shapiro, as everyone from the premier host to the Westwood One host to the podcasters to everybody yeah. was all going to be reading the same copy that Lee was writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> Had to raise $6 million, and I had some fundraising experience from working for Lee. We went and raised the $6 million, which was crazy, to raise $6 million. And then we executed strategy July to November, blood, sweat, and tears, 80 hours a week, hardest I've ever worked in my entire life. Um, and it came down in November, and I'm one of those crazy tinfoil hat people that thinks the election was stolen. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%, baby. <laughs> 100%. And so I watched that happen, and I just became disenfranchised with national media, national fundraising, national politics. Yeah. I felt like fixing, Washi fixing Washington, D.C. was like trying to squirt out the sun with a water pistol. Mm -hmm. It's just like we, we, can't, we can't do it. We don't have that kind of horsepower. And so I went to church shortly after that. My pastor started preaching on localism. 
fathers fix your family families be in church churches make up community community city city county county state this is the winning strategy so i went home and prayed with my wife and said okay god how can i use my gifts talents abilities resources relationships to make a difference for my people in place here in alabama where you have me and a week later caleb crosby calls me from the alabama policy institute i hadn't talked to caleb in a year was not friends with caleb we knew each other we'd met a couple times but you know this is wild he just calls me out of the blue yeah hey i know you're a radio guy um, we've got a guy who's getting a radio show in Huntsville who's our chief policy officer can you help us figure out how we need to do this show and I'm like sure and I basically just give him a free consultation spend like an hour on the phone with him sell your inventory for this you're gonna have to cover that blah blah blah, blah. and um, at the end of the call he says you know what we need uh, as much if not more than a radio show in Huntsville is a statewide state focused news and multimedia company to take out AL.com I was like I'll do it and uh that was it and that was the beginning of it and so um he said put it put together a mission vision plan and a budget and i did i wrote it out spent a ton of time mission vision plan budget drove up to birmingham i live in Wetumpka. drove up to birmingham and sat down with he and, and carl jones who was the chief operating officer there and sat down with him and presented my plan and they loved it and we got to work and we went and raised a bunch of philanthropic capital we, we began as part of the alabama policy institute they kind of operate as my training wheels like i've never ran a business before you yeah, know yeah. so they they helped me kind of you know get oriented and made sure that i was crossing my t's and dot my i's and once i felt comfortable with that we separated and turned into our own entity and um as i said earlier now the second largest statewide publication in the state dude al.com wishes they had a story like this yeah. they just wish what a bunch of losers yeah yes. taking a taking out al.com i think uh would have been something we would have always welcomed I mean, al.com as as sucks they no, but, but suck. what they do and again you got me on a long form podcast bro i can talk <laughs> <laughs> you're good and um what they do though is the left buys institutions because they understand the power of culture to shape policy right yep. they understand that politics and public policy is downstream from culture this is my open in my podcast with it always goes through but politics and public policy is downstream from culture and they know that media drives culture and so they wait for institutions to get like devalued and they go in and buy them and so what happened in in, in alabama and it was everywhere across the country in 2007 all the car dealership ads mortgage ads left print journalism and went craigslist facebook google mm. when that happened it gutted all of the um the print journalism, like it gutted their revenue. So they had to fire all these reporters, Birmingham News, Mobile Press Register, Huntsville Times, they had to fire all these reporters. So if you think about it from a standpoint of um, like there's 10,000 law enforcement officers in the state of Alabama, if they fired 9,000 of them, okay, there'd be a thousand left. What do you think would happen to crime? It would freaking go through the roof. Well, when you fired all these journalists, right, like government corruption goes through the roof. And, yeah. and we've we've graphed this out when when a, when a legitimate news publication goes under the cost of going doing government goes like skyrockets. Yeah. OK. And so this is what happened and it happened all over the place. And when money left print journalism, conservatives left print journalism because conservatives uh, or it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a blessing, a curse to be conservative. We care about money. We, we want to see returns. We want to see profits like that's what mo moves us and motivates us. And so they leave. And so now here's. The Birmingham News, the Mobile Press Register, and the Huntsville Times, these once prestigious, incredible institutions of journalism, investigative journalism, reporting that the entire state was blessed and benefited from these institutions. And they have these, these mastheads that are trusted for hundreds of years that my daddy read it, my granddaddy read it, and his dad before right. him, right, type of trust. And so the left, this group out of New Jersey and New York, Advanced Media and Newhouse Publications, comes in and buys up these three major publications under the Alabama Media Group and then uh, creates a website to disseminate the content, and it's the and it's AL.com. And it's they, these northern values coming through right. an Alabama website. Yeah. Or and Alabama coastal. publications. Sure, yeah. and it's, you know, you no good dirty rednecks are trying to raise the clan again. You bitter clingers bitterly clinging to your guns and your Bibles. How yeah. dare you? The freaking editor they just hired, did you see this? Uh -uh. The editor they just hired is this black guy that came from Gannett. Gannett's another big, you know, liberal public news publication group that owns USA Today. Yeah. And a bunch of small town publications all over the country. And he is he has a lawsuit filed against him from his time at Gannett because he he put in a hiring policy that you couldn't hire any more white males in management. 
<laughs> right. That's that's the editor in chief they chose for for Alabama. You know, we should really like make a concerted effort just to shame every white person at AL.com, especially that guy that draws the awful cartoons. What's his name? JD Crow. JD he, Crow. He, he, he did one of me. That's what I knew. I made. Oh it. man. That right, when I, when, worse. Now it wasn't me personally that was made into it, but it was the burn the freaking books. I don't know if you saw that story. Uh. Uh-uh. AL.com did this huge like investigative piece about what's going on in the libraries. It's like, well, there's porn that's grooming children into questioning <laughs> right. their gender. That's what's going on. I could have saved you friggin' eight thousand words. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. But I was at this. They, they, the, the Prattville Library people invited me to do this. You know, uh, forum or whatever to talk about this stuff. And I'm like, I don't really know what there is to talk about. There's, there's porn in the children's section. Yeah, but, and it's not just porn. It's pornographic with the intent to groom and get children to question Correct. their gender. Correct. Very common, basic stuff. And you know, because of everyone's like First Amendment and all these like, and again, like I love the Constitution, but like we, at some point, sometimes you just got just got to back up and look at what's going on and just be normal. You gotta yeah protect and, children. And, and correct. Yeah. Like it's all this other stuff, and so. <clears throat> Like, well, we think that maybe we should move the books from the children's section to the teenage section. I'm like, burn the freaking <laughs> books. Because yeah, that's what the left is always saying, right? They're like, uh, are you a book burner? And I'm like, I don't know. What kind of books are they? Yeah, like, you know, and like, like, like that insult you're going to hurl at me. And I'm like, well, I'm not a book burner. I'm not one of those. I'm like, burn those freaking books, dude. They, burn they the books. Taken, taken what was once. Take, take the example of. You're a racist. Yeah. All right. That used to be kind of a hurtful thing to call yeah. somebody because nobody wants to be a, known as a racist. Sure. But now if somebody calls you a racist, it's like, whatever. That means nothing. That yeah. word holds no more value. And it's basically if you're in our world and someone hasn't called you racist, you know, and it's like, why am I racist? Well, because you're white and you have seven children. <laughs> you're you're right. trying to protect the white hegemony. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're trying to put more white people in too. the world. You're homeschooling too. Tisk, tisk. And it's like, all these white children with your white <laughs> curriculum <laughs> in yeah. your home. Oh, man. That's crazy. Is, if AL.com is is spending time attacking your outlet, you're doing something Correct. right. Yeah. Uh, some of the, I think one of the biggest ones y'all got going on, uh, or I say y'all, the state of Alabama has got going on right now, is this deal up in Huntsville. Sure. Uh, I think God dubbed it uh, the space gay whenever I started, <laughs> before we started the show. Uh, and... I have not really covered this story on my radio show uh, because everybody else was kind of talking. I don't, I don't do a whole lot of state issues, which is why it's good for me to have you on the show, on the podcast. Uh, but what I understand on its face is you've got space camp in Huntsville, uh, a counselor in a female dorm Correct is uh, is transgender has a penis has a pp and uh, that nobody knew it until when did a parent tip him off or what I think they were all aware that he had a penis but a- but, everybody- but 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 the parents whose children were going to be staying there became aware right and so we were aware of it and then obviously Coach Tuberville put out a thing um, pretty quickly. And we, we being, you know, responsible journalists, we had to look into call question and all that stuff before we put the story up. But we, you know, heard about it, immediately got to work on it um, and and kind of exposed the fact that this guy who was going to be entrusted with all these girls was in fact, I mean, it was was a guy, right, that, that, that thinks he's a girl. It's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, and again, it goes back to, um, you know, and everyone's like, I can't believe you would do that. He has feelings, too. And it's like, yeah, but the girls like what about the girls in the camp like what about them like is does no one does no one care about them does nobody does like why does that not the number one priority is the safety of those children right and really outside of that tony up i just sent you an email if you'll grab that it's a tweet that i found earlier today it's it this turns out to be much bigger than just uh somebody being trans and like oh you're a transphobe you just don't like them because they're trans when you go to this person's social media, click that top left uh, picture. Uh, right uh, now, go back, go back one. Uh, the four squares, yeah. Click that top left square, yeah. This is some of the social media posts from this person, allegedly, from what I understand. Allegedly, <laughs> it says uh, Nova loves you is is the trans's Twitter handle, and it says things like, "I don't know who needs to hear this, but there's no rule that says you can't do a phone interview." While you're still depressed, ass is half naked in bed. Another one says, you know, for all the bigots that keep saying, they're shoving this trans agenda down our throats, I have to laugh. Because if I was shoving something down your throat, 
you wouldn't have a choice but to shut the f up. Click that. Click the next button uh, over to the far right. Uh, let's see. What's uh? Go go to the next one. Something about Femboy. Uh, years ago, I ordered ten of these stickers from blah blah blah, and today I placed the last one in my collection. Next week, I start teaching kids about space. I hope they see my notebook and feel proud to be themselves in this big universe. Says gender is a universe. One more. Uh, there's what? a there's a uh, drawing of a what looks like a furry with a, with a penis sticking out. <laughs> Uh, like it, it's just, it, 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 there was very, I saw several of these and they're very graphic things that this person is posting, obviously showing that they are, um, a, a perv, you know, yeah. and not, not ashamed of it. So why would they not, why would this person not push that off on the kids? Yeah, I think it's it just, I just had a, a metaphor pop into my brain. Occasionally that happens. I'm like, this is like this or it's like that. Yeah. So <clears throat> When when people enter our country illegally, they are by definition criminals mm -hmm. immediately. The moment they cross the border, they are now illegal, which makes them criminals. They're breaking the law. They're very presence here. And so they're like, well, how do you know they're criminals? Because they broke the law to get Correct. here. Correct. They're immediately criminals the moment they're here. And I'm the same way when it goes to this kind of stuff. If, if there is a guy who believes he's a girl and is posting the stuff like we're seeing, he is automatically a pervert. Right. Right? Like, every man is is a potential pervert in a dorm full of girls, okay? Like, every single man, like, no man should be trusted in there. Yeah, it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate for a man to be in a girl's dorm. Like, like that is something that no man needs to be doing. Specifically, a man who th thinks he's a woman and post this weird stuff about shoving people down people's throats so they can shut the F up. Like, right. that dude for sure doesn't need to be near anybody's daughters, right? Well, and there's so many out there that we think about this thing that happened at Planet Fitness recently where you have uh, some guy was in the women's locker room and he was shaving and some lady said something about it and they canceled her membership. Yeah. This dude's like, well, I'm trans, I'm LGBTQ, whatever. And, uh, you know, there's guys out there that are pretending to be girls just for the sake of being able to get in those dorms sure. or in, in, in those locker rooms. But what kills me is how they 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 continue to say things such as, um, you know, you have to accept these people for who they are. I'm like, you can't even accept you for who you are. You yeah. can't even accept your own gender. Why do I have to accept this make-believe thing? Yeah. I mean, if you're an adult, do what you want to do, but the the line gets drawn at the kids. Yeah, and also at me having to play along. Yes, not right? playing along. I've never played along from the very, very beginning. You know, it was like, oh, it's it's Caitlyn Jenner. That's Bruce with a penis. Yeah, it's Bruce. That's Bruce. That oh, is not Bruce. Caitlyn, right? And the, so that's that's my feeling on it. But The other big story that you guys had going on, which really got y'all some clicks because everybody all over the world started picking this up. Sure. Uh, was the Smith Station. The Smith Station's right around Auburn, right? Yeah. This pastor, Bubba Copeland, everybody probably knows the story by now, but he's a pastor at a, it was a small church, right? A small church? No, it's First Baptist Church of Phoenix City. So it was City. a big, big church. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like Monster Mega Church in Birmingham with 50,000 people or whatever, yeah. but it was, I mean... For that first, area? First Baptist Church in Phoenix City, I think it, I mean, it was sizable. I don't know if it's 500, I don't know if it's 1,000, but it was enough. So this guy's a longtime pastor. He ends up uh, being found out about, he's, he's had some, some weird things going on where he's dressing up as uh, a girl and doing some sexual stuff online and writing some some weird homo novels. Homoerotic homo erotic, homo, homo erotic <laughs> novels, I can't even say it. Words. <laughs> and... Uh, he ends up getting outed. Now, how did... Because you were the guys that broke the story. Sure. How how did that come about in the first place? Like, y'all no, yeah. don't see your reporters to Smith Station every day. Yeah, I'm sure. no. And so, I mean, just like, you know, police, like, you, you work off leads more than you do actually, you know, seeing stuff that we're always looking. Right. We're always patrolling, but more often than not, it comes from... And so then you develop people who... Um, provide you good leads and and then you become trusted and so mm -hmm. this was actually a trusted source who brought us the story and said hey you know there's this guy he's you know and not only you know was he uh you know doing some of these sexual exploits but there's also some 
weird land deals with him as the mayor, you know, buying property that belongs like I just it was it was the whole thing. A lot of you know, shadiness. A lot, a, lot, a lot of shadiness going on. And um, But as, as we looked into it, as Craig, our reporter, began to look into it, um, the graphic nature of some of the you know trans porn, if that's when you want to call mm-hmm. it, but it's like it's it's a public figure. It's a, a double public figure, a pastor and a mayor. So that's it's right. two public figures on public forums, Reddit and other public forums, porn sites and stuff that are all public. You don't have to have passwords or anything to get into. Public Double public figure on public forums. Posting pictures of himself dressed in drag or as a trans person. Um, the thing that really caught our attention was there was a meme that he posted. Uh, and in the meme, it had pictures of children. And he made it look like the, the children, like it was like this this 12-year-old boy. And then the other girl, it was ended up like a 14-year-old girl. And it made it look like the boy trans to the girl. And on the on the meme, it said, um, I don't want to I don't want to get this wrong. It said, um get the shots no take the shots get the implants become the whore mm. and then i had pictures of these children transitioning well then when we post the story the dad of those children calls is like please take my children's pictures like those wow. are children from the community wow and he's like you know going you know on social media and putting them on his you know his tranny you know fantasy stuff or whatever and so that that meme mixed with some of the the graphic nature the photos mixed with the homoerotic fiction that he was writing that was it was just horrendous, dude. This and, is a uh, sick dude that that just happened to get some power. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I sit here and think about the process. Like this had to be who he was before he was the mayor. Sure. This had to be who he was before he was the pastor. Yeah, and he was a youth pastor before he was a pastor. Oh my right? god! I wonder what happened there. And so uh, this all this is all horrendous. And this guy sounds like a really awful person, but. Once the story comes out, who's the bad guy? Well, Brian yeah. Dawson's the bad guy. Eighteen nineteen's the bad guy. How sure. dare you? But yeah. when you guys became the villains of this story, did that happen before? Because everybody knows kind of how this plays out. So this this mayor and pastor ends up committing suicide. Did y'all catch heat before that happened? We we caught some heat, and and it was basically like, why should why are you doing this? Da 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 da, and you know whatever. But I mean, it, it became national news really quick, and because it was national news, the cops went to do a wellness check on him. Hey, how are you doing? And so they saw his car, and so they flipped their lights on to do a wellness check, and he takes off, mm. right? Which is a, a fact worth noting. Yeah. So he takes off. the The chase comes to an end, and he gets out of the car and shoots himself. Yeah. Um, and you know we find out about that. This is tragic, whatever. But yeah, that's when the 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 liberal media basically, you know, if uh, the amount of times I was told that I have blood on my hands and you know all this other stuff, and it's like, look, man, people said, you know, and and it, it got crazy. I mean, so we were front page news on the New York Times, Washington Post, Guardian, Daily Beast. I mean, you name it. Um, the amount of hit pieces that were written about us and in these major national publications, we were front page news and some new Delhi publication and some United Kingdom publication. I mean, mm. It was just, it was, it was crazy. And for three weeks it was nonstop. And so there was, um, you know, they were taking pictures of my kids and putting it on social media with my home address underneath talking about, be ashamed if something happened to your kids and this kind of stuff, yeah. threatening to kill my family. Same thing happened to Jeff poor. Same thing happened to Craig Monger, these type of threats. And like, you don't know if one of these people is deranged enough to do something, you know? So it was. I would have got on the internet. I'd be like, "Y'all don't know how crazy Brian Dawson yeah. is. You might not want to show up at his house, cool. <laughs> That might have, that might have worked. <laughs> that dude's seen favor. some stuff. <laughs> yeah. But um, so that happens, and you know, but afterwards, someone asked me like, "Would you do it again?" I said, "In a heartbeat." Yeah. I, because at the end of the day, we know that by exposing again, if I was a member of that church, would I want to know that that was my pastor? If I was a, a you know uh, uh, a citizen of that town, would I want to know that was my mayor? Because another one of the things that came out. One of the homoerotic novels he wrote was about him transitioning into this real woman who had a, a hair sal- a hair salon either in Phoenix City or Smith Station. It was her real name and it was the name of her salon in this fiction where he was going to kill her and transition into her identity so that he could have sex with her husband. Mm. Right? And it's like, if your mayor's writing stuff like that about you, imagine... That's a red flag. Yeah. Man. Imagine... A- uh, you know, uh, what's the guy's name? Randall Woodfin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look at his journal and he's he's you know, coming after Andrew. But let's, uh, let's not uh, <laughs> completely dismiss that. That's possible. Uh, so, yeah, that's this is crazy because the, the, the media, the same media that spent their time attacking you, and I, I, we actually got a clip from NBC that was talking about this. 
uh, these these same media outlets and these same reporters that were so upset by this would have been all over this if they got the story first. They would say small town backwards, uh, Alabama mayor and pastor, because they don't miss an opportunity yeah. to attack Christians sure. and attack Republicans. This would have been a perfect hypocrite uh, Bubba Copeland over here dressing like a woman but trying to preach the gospel. On yeah. They would have they eaten that up, and they would have he'd have been on Saturday Night Live. Stephen Colbert would have been talking about it. But you guys picked up the story. He blows his brains out, and then all of a sudden, oh, we loved Bubba Copeland. He was yeah. just a trans guy like the rest of us. And it's like... No, he was a sick dude. Here, yeah. uh, play play this NBC clip real quick. Let's take it down south where, where tonight a small town in Alabama is mourning the loss of their mayor who died of an apparent suicide just days after a conservative news site published a story that showed alleged photos of him on social media, allegedly wearing women's clothes and makeup. They claim he led a secret life and labeled himself on sites as a transgender curvy girl. NBC News is not going to show those what? pictures. The news site did not respond <laughs> Thanks to Alabama's press for comment. Copeland is also the pastor at a local church where he addressed the two articles just two days before he died. Listen. I apologize for any embarrassment caused by my private and personal life. I have nothing to be ashamed of. A lot of things that were said were taken out of context. Mm. I want to bring in Morgan Chesky, who's covering this one for us tonight. Morgan, Mayor Copeland had been the mayor of this town, Smith's Station, for years. What else do we know about him and how this happened? To how highly they speak yeah, of him. Uh, Halley, uh, elected back in 2016. We know the Smith Station is a town of about 5,000 people. And when Bubba Copeland was elected, it was reported that he really wanted to try to grow this small community, bring new business in. It was a place that he recently described as a modern-day Mayberry. And by all accounts, he was successful during his tenure as mayor. And you mentioned, Halley, he wasn't just the mayor of Of course, Smith this is the big thing. Yeah. Okay, so... The, you you see the glowing review that they're giving of sure. oh man he was he's been here since 2016 he was growing the city oh look he's with Donald Trump you know and they they just they act as if they wouldn't have been all over this they, this one personally is my favorite this is the Young Turks this is uh, this is when you know you've really rubbed Which, people yeah. the wrong way uh, when the Young Turks are talking about you. A mayor tragically took his own life days after a conservative outlet published photos of him wearing women's clothing. Bubba Copeland was also a pastor and the mayor of Smith Station, Alabama. Now, Craig Monger is the fear monger in question here. Fear monger. Oh, fear monger there. 1819 <laughs> oh, News. That's the conservative publication. Smith Station's mayor operated social media accounts as a transgender woman under the pseudonym Brittany Blair Summerlin. Craig Monger interviewed Copeland, who said that the posts were ways of getting rid of stress. Now, after the interview, Copeland promptly <laughs> That's a weird way to get rid of stress. and asked them not to be made public due to his family and his position as a pastor. But of course, the publication made those images public anyway. And out yes. of respect for Bubba Copeland and his family, we are not going to show you those images, and we are not going to do anything um, that would, you know, uplift the disgusting like reporting here that took place. Because there was really no public interest in reporting this. Okay, None? Bubba Copeland <laughs> was not some bigot who went around judging the lifestyles of others. He wasn't someone who uh, wanted to pass legislation against transgender people. That wasn't who he was. So you can't use that cover uh, to justify what this publication did. Um, and it's a right-wing publication whose uh, editor-in-chief used to work over at Breitbart. This is a publication that Steve Bannon once Jeff. called fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> now, after 1819 published the photos, Bubba Copeland addressed the church about it. We've got that video. Let's watch. Okay, we don't have to watch that again. We've already seen Bubba once. Uh, so you see this glowing review of Bubba Copeland. We are not going to show you the pictures. By the way, thank you. We don't need to see them again. Yeah. But this awful news outlet had the audacity to report the news of something awful that was. And they, of course, they omit all the uh, disgusting, you know, pedophilic behavior that yeah. was going on within this. Why does it always seem the left ends up defending pedophilia? 
it, I, I call this kind of the trans George Floyd. <laughs> yeah, you know? kind of is. Um, it's that same mentality. Um, and again, I, I think I thought the same thing. If 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 the folks at AL dot com would have got to this, you know, got the story before us, it would have mm-hmm. been, you know, it would have been, you know, um, conservative right wing yep. pastor, you know, da 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 da. Um, and that's the other thing that was real wild is the one thing that we get hit with all the time from the left is how come you don't expose pastors? How there's all this sexual stuff going on in these churches and you don't expose pastors. Well, we did, and then we were. Then y'all got bit out of shape about that. it, and so you know. But at the end of the day, we're going to continue to do what we think is right, and that you know that Breitbart editor that they talked about, Jeff Poor. Mm-hmm. There's very few people with better news judgment than him. They're just it, like he's just he's just good. Um, sometimes I'd like him to go a little bit farther, on, not not necessarily in this area, but like on other things, and and he's actually wiser and has decades of experience and, and can explain to me like, well, no, this is why not, or this, you know, so. He's um he's very very good. I trust him completely, and we're we're just going to continue to do what we think is in the best interest of the people of Alabama and the citizens of these towns. And at the end of the day, it goes back to if you were if if your children were in a youth group at that church, would you want to know? Mm-hmm. And if if you were a citizen and your mayor, who again went and for sure, you know, on his campaign speeches, had the shotgun over his shoulder with the church steeple in the background and the John Deere tractor to go get them conservative votes, you know, um, and, and was doing this stuff, would you want to know? And they never talk about, they always say, he was dressed in women's clothes. <laughs> like, and again, if that was the story, if he just, if he dressed up in his wife's clothes in his living room and that was all there was to the story, it's probably not a story. Right. But it was so far beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, it's just, it's egregious, but, you know. It shows show, so how dishonest these people are. And by the way, I want to I want to confirm Jeff is a great guy. There was one time where I was complaining on the radio about how I couldn't find anywhere to stream the Andrew Breitbart movie called Hating Breitbart. Yeah. And Jeff, who was with Breitbart at the time, uh, actually had them mail me a DVD copy of that movie so wow. I could have it. I still have it to this day. So uh, Jeff's a good dude. I've uh, I've known him for what was that a little movie bit. About? It was just Breitbart's uh, life from like twenty twenty ten to. It was like a, uh, a documentary kind of thing. Did it talk about how he died? Uh, no, uh, they, I thoughts? think they finished it before he died. I think he probably got hit with a heart attack. Gun. I mean, they took. There's like no. You guys. There's no doubt in my That's mind they I took like him out. Guys. That's why I put my money on. Yeah. yeah, he got the Seth Rich treatment. You yeah. know these guys. I mean. Mm. It's 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 the way it goes. But if, if people is, can't wake up to this stuff, we're we're th- this is why we can't win is because everybody wants to believe the like oh that no no this wouldn't happen mm. no no it's like no it's happening all the time. Who was again here? I'll go full tinfoil hat here for you guys. Now you ain't gonna out tinfoil us. We're going we're all gonna be on the same page. <laughs> who who I can't think of his name. I can Google it. I'm sure, and you guys probably know the name. Um, Kelly Loeffler's <laughs> staffer that was dating Governor Kemp's uh, daughter. Okay. Um, I don't remember that. Man, well, I'm going to have him look it up. I'm going to do the Joe Rogan where you point to the guy. I need, oh, I need a the, guy yeah, on That's my the beauty podcast. of this, yeah. Um, and Tony Kelly Gumba. Loeffler? Kelly Loeffler. She was, the, she was the United States senator that lost uh, in the 2020 election right. through the same fashion that Trump lost. Loeffler yeah. aid. When Georgia just went blue all of a sudden. <laughs> Except Brian Kemp. Brian oh, Kemp yeah, was the it. one Republican came out. You're talking about the uh, what, 20 uh, dies in a, the crash? Yeah, and it was, um, what's her name? Yeah, click yeah, that the article. The guy's name so was like got. Hudson or, I don't know why I can't think of his name. Loeffler campaign staffer, 20 dies in South Georgia crash. And uh, so anyway, it, it was, so this is when Governor Kemp was talking about doing all these audits and everything, and then all of a sudden, Governor Kemp's daughter's boyfriend, who's a, an aide for Leffler, said he died in a car crash well then it, it flashes the footage of the car crash and it looks like a missile was shot like from a drone and just like blew the car to smithereens and there's wow. like a pit and flames and all this other stuff harrison deal that's his name oh, harrison yeah. deal you can youtube go to youtube and put harrison deal crash that's crazy yeah see if you can pull up that uh that video we'll just look at that car real quick before we get out of here now i'm fascinated by this because that's dude that's that's where we're at i'm on the station I'm known as the guy that's kind of out here. Everybody else tries to keep it inside of um, a respectable 
like don't want to seem crazy realm, but I'm the one that like I, I'll if y'all want to think I'm crazy, that's fine. I'll go ahead yeah. and go out here. I've already I've already gone too far as it is. I'm so. Trying to find it here. Yeah, what did we say his name? Harrison Deal. Yeah, Harrison, Harrison Deal, Deal car crash or something. I just I mean there was there was it wasn't the news coverage. It was like someone who drove by and they may have taken there it off. Go, here the second go. one. Yeah. 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 You see it? <laughs> just a little fender bender. Oh, uh, I think. I think you gotta go. Is this is this it? Is it oh, okay? Yeah. Little fender bender. Uh, There's no, <laughs> no volume. That is, uh, yeah. That's 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 not a fender bender. Yeah. Go. I mean, I guess cars can get in wrecks and set on fire. I mean, that does happen. That's, but that's a little extreme. <laughs> that's a little extreme, is it not? And yeah. Go back. Go back one. Uh, uh, click backwards and look at that second video that was on that list. It looked like it might have had a different angle on it. Try this that one? one, yeah. I don't think it does. We it's are beginning with developing news involving a deadly forward. crash in Chatham County. News 3 has learned a campaign worker for Senator Kelly oh, Leffler has died. Oh. And it's it will happen. be closed until... Yeah, Whoa. Whoa. look at that. ...as investigators continue to work the scene. <laughs> we have no idea what happened. It's an <laughs> absolute <laughs> coincidence that Governor Kemp's Senator daughter's Lefler. boyfriend who worked for Kelly Loeffler, who's also trying to win an election right now, we don't know how he died. Apparently, he uh, bumped into the rail and and everything going on in Georgia. Brian Kemp's on in on every bit of it. Yeah, every bit of that's the argument they they like to make is well, if you think Georgia's being stolen, I mean, how does Brian Kemp win? Because Brian Kemp's in on it. Yeah, he can't. He all he's got to do is keep his mouth shut and pretend like they had the safest election in history. And who's that Secretary of State too? Who's in on it? Uh, Raffensperger. Yeah, right. Do you guys know Greg Phillips? I was going to ask you about that. I saw him on your show. He's one of my best friends, yeah. I would love to have him on this yeah, he'll podcast. Come, yeah, he'll come in. We probably could only post it on Rumble and not YouTube, but yeah. I'd love to have him in I'd here and talk to you. They let me stay on YouTube. I don't care. <laughs> we just try to, like, when we talk about certain things such as, you know, the 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 pandemic, we try to use Pig Latin for yeah. YouTube. So we call it Ovid K. Or the Axine Bay, or you know whatever yeah. coup for whatever. Udclot Bay. Yeah, the, yeah, <laughs> the Udclot Bay. So, um, yeah, we would love to have him on the show, man. Yeah. That guy's fascinating. He he and I went and watched uh, as soon as Two Thousand Mules came out. Him and I went to the theater together and watched yeah. it with our wives. Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I was I, in the back of the theater taking pictures with my phone for show prep the next yeah. day. Yeah, he's uh, he spends a lot of time in Birmingham, so man. I don't think it'd be a problem to get him in here. That would be awesome. Let's hook that up. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you taking the time to come. To, this is uh, I don't think anybody so far has come on this podcast and told a more fascinating story than you have. True. I really mean that. That's uh, that's good stuff, and I can't wait for people to see it. Which uh, we'll have to have you back in here because we're gonna have to just do a whole full blown tinfoil hat show. Yeah. Because it was just now starting to get good. Now I gotta get out of Jeff here. Jeff loves it when I do that too, by the way. And he's just like God. <laughs> And I just gotta say for the record, your wife's awesome. I like good yeah. investors that buy good stocks That's at the lowest value. She is a savvy investor indeed. Yeah. She's smart. Well, cool, man. Thanks again, Brian. Yeah. Uh, 1819news.com. Yeah, go to 1819news.com. You can go there if you want to support us financially. There's a, a button at the top that says become a member. Click that. Membership start as little as $5 a month. With that, you get access to overtime segments, behind-the-scene content, uh, and you get cool merch. We got, we've got we got the greatest hats. Yeah. Um, and uh, but, but but if not that, if you're not signed up to the news for the newsletter, you are absolutely missing out. Um, our newsletter drives the news cycle in the state of Alabama. I mean, people that hate me, people that love me, tell me the same thing. You know, either I, I, I hate you guys, you da da da, but it's the first thing I read every morning. Or yeah. man, you guys are doing a great job. It's the first thing I read every morning at five forty-five in the morning. So uh, that newsletter, I always say, there's two things that happen every morning, and you may uh, actually be able to to, to confirm this. Uh, at five forty-five, there's legislators on their knees praying to God they're not in the newsletter. And then there's radio show hosts that get up to do their show prep and they grab the newsletter, right? That's and, right. And so we're, you know, um, holding accountable and then and driving the news cycle. Good stuff. What so. about the podcast? Yeah, 1819 News, the podcast. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm not on the YouTubes. They don't like me. Yeah. And so uh, you can go Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Rumble, uh, any podcast app. And, you know, you never know what you're going to get on that podcast. I've interviewed Gene Stallings, John Hanna, John Croyle, Alabama football, Bear Bryant. I've had Greg Phillips. I've had... You know, um, 
I mean, just whoever, just interesting people. I have them come on, and there's usually there's usually an Alabama uh, angle to mm-hmm. it. Um, but you know, I mean, Steve Marshall comes on every three months. Uh, the Attorney General here, Will Ainsworth, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, comes on every three months. So just a, a cornucopia of goodness. That's AT&T awesome. Nineteen News, the podcast. Well, cool. Again, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony Gump, for everything you do, my friend. No problem. Yep. You, uh, you're the man. You're the man uh, as well, Brian. Uh, we will get you on here again soon, my friend. Awesome. All right. Until next time, see you, cuz.